Hosea chapter 3. Uh, if you're at home and you want to turn there or click there, if you're here in the sanctuary uh, and you're using one of the pew Bibles, this is on page 752. Uh, 752. It'll also be up on the screen as well, but it's always cool to have it in front of you. Uh, before we jump into this, let's pray together. God, we are very grateful, just as Kale said earlier, for your love. The immense love that you have for us, the love which you pursue us with and hound us with, that you chase us down wanting to be in relationship with us. God, I pray you would let us know this morning how amazing your love is. God, I pray that you would let us know the depth of it. God, let us know, um, experience it and know the truth of it in a real way, that you love us. God, in whatever reason or way or specific way that we need to know that or be reminded of it, I pray you would penetrate our uh, distractions, our excuses, the lies that we might be listening to, and that we would hear the truth of your word that you love us. We're so grateful for our church and what you're doing in this place. Uh, for those who are traveling or will be traveling, God, we pray you're just blessing with protection upon them. But in this moment now, I just pray that you would speak to us. And so spirit, move in this place or wherever we're watching. In your name, amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. How many of you, when you were younger, um, were familiar with a letter like this? Um, maybe you got one of these when you were younger, maybe you sent one, maybe you wanted to receive one, maybe you wanted to send one but decided not to for whatever reason, maybe you were in college or a little bit older and you received or sent one, trying to be creative and cute with somebody. Um, how many of you I, I'm not going to ask how many ever get. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at we're familiar with that, all right? This is, this is Christmas week. We want to keep it encouraging. But there's a lot of different ways that this could go down, right? Someone could say no. And that is just the worst. You put yourself out there. You're taking a chance. There's vulnerability happening. And then when you see that no, it's oh, right? Somebody could say yes. And there's butterflies, and there's this giddiness, and if you're in elementary school when the note is passed, this is just going to be a, such an exciting couple days that this lasts, or maybe a couple weeks. When you're older, then you're hoping for a little bit longer than that, right? But there are also different things that we can wrestle with when it comes to the writing of one of these notes. What, we want someone to check yes. We want, which seems kind of, well, yeah, why write one, though? But we want someone. But someone might think, hey, I'm good on my own. I don't need someone to check a box for me to be okay. And there's actually something healthy about that. But deep down, we have to acknowledge that we want to be loved. We want somebody to check the box, yes. We want to be wanted. But then there's also the idea, just thinking through writing one of these things, will they check yes? How will they respond? We might not know how somebody feels, and so there's a trepidation within that. But also how we view ourselves might be going on as we think through writing one of these. Would they love me? I mean, how, how could somebody check yes for me? Would they check yes if they knew this? I mean, it's a simple piece of paper, but there is a lot more than just a simple piece of paper going on here, right? It gets to the heart of a core question about what it means to be human. Does anyone love me? Am I wanted? Now, I, I can't tell you or guarantee what anyone or anyone else feels any more than really you can. But I can tell you what God communicates to us about his love for us. I can, over the last month of Advent, we have been looking at different prophets from the Old Testament. 
and what they shared about the Messiah to come. The, the, the people didn't know exactly, his, they didn't know his name was Jesus, but there was different things about him that they were anticipating. And we've talked about the hope that he establishes. We've talked about the peace that he grants. We've talked about the joy that he provides. And now today we want to talk about his love. And before I get into it, let me just cut to the chase with the most important thing. To the question, do you love me? God always checks yes. You coming to God with the question, do you love me, God? And he always, always and forever, without a doubt, without hesitancy, he checks yes, that he loves you. And so today, just thinking about this, we want to look at Hosea 3 to talk about this idea of God's love. Now, Hosea's context is very much like the other prophets that we've looked at. We have to understand what was going on during their time to understand what they were saying and why they were saying it. One of my old prof professors, his name is Paul Benware, he said this about the book of Hosea. He said, Hosea did not minister in pleasant times. Israel was in, a, in, a, in as bad a spiritual and moral situation as she had ever been. And it was just as bad politically. After the death of Jeroboam II, murder and intrigue were common in Israeli politics. Out of the last six kings on the throne, only one died a natural death in office. Morally and spiritually, the people were almost completely defiled. Hosea is writing to people in this scenario, going through this. Another scholar, Mary Evans, she adds to this, idolatry was rampant, respect for God's law was non-existent, and the people were in fact treating Yahweh as an idol or a Baal who could be pacified by presence and bribed into acting on Israel's behalf. And so when you hear these descriptions, it's God's chosen people were living like strangers to him. Those he made a covenant with were acting like that covenant didn't exist, and God was just an option among many. Pretty much everything that defined God's covenant people, relationship with Israel, they were disregarding or diminishing or disrespecting. And so it's into this that Hosea speaks. It's to people who are acting like this, who are treating God this way, that he speaks about God's love. And into, when we start off in Hosea 3, the first thing he's going to tell us is this, is that God loves us regardless of anything about us. God loves us regardless of anything about us. It says in that first verse, the Lord said to me, so the Lord said to Hosea, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man as in an, and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. God led Hosea to marry Gomer, a promiscuous woman, someone who may have been a prostitute in the temples at the time. And she was unfaithful time and time again to Hosea. She's not even mentioned here by name. The thought is, is that her unfaithfulness has made it where she doesn't even deserve to be called Hosea's wife. And those in Israel are looking at this prophet. Could have, they could have been asking the same questions that we'd be asking. Why would God want him to choose to love someone like this? Why would God want Hosea to keep pursuing and loving somebody who acted this way and treated him this way. Now, before we answer that, an important clarification needs to be made. First off, this isn't a call for all people, but this is something very specific to Hosea. It doesn't mean that divorce because of adultery is wrong or shouldn't happen. In fact, Jesus talks about that in Matthew 19 and allows it for that. This is a very unique situation for a very specific time whose implications are still important for us. In fact, 
my old prof Ben Ware, he says this, extreme times often call for extreme or unusual methods. The nation of Israel had heard the words of many of God's prophets, but the messages of these spokesmen for God had fallen on insensitive ears. So God chose to use a rather extreme approach to get the attention of his people. God chose to use his prophet and his family as an object lesson for Israel. And what is that lesson? What is that message? That God wanted Hosea to choose someone like Gomer because he wanted humanity to realize he chooses people like us. God wanted Hosea to love and pursue Gomer regardless of what she did because he wanted us to know that he loves and pursues us regardless of what we've done. God knows everything about you and he loves you. God knows everything about you and he loves you. You've had that experience of people coming over. So you went through and you cleaned up the whole house. Or maybe you closed off that one room because you don't want anybody to see the mess that's in there. I may or may not be speaking from experience by saying this. We've had that, right? People are coming over. We need to clean up. Well, here's the thing. God knows what your house looks like. He knows everything in that room that you have closed off. He knows everything about our lives, and he loves us. God doesn't start loving you once you clean up the mess. God loves you in the mess. God loves you regardless of anything else because his love is not based on what we do. It's based on who he is. There is nothing secret about us from God, and he loves us. There is nothing surprising about you to God, and he loves you. There is nothing messy. There is nothing too messy about you to God. He loves you. Romans tells us, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die, die for us while we were sinners. He knew everything about us and he loved us to act on that to help us while we were messed up. It says in Ephesians 2, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. There is nothing more important that you need to hear today than that. Because maybe for you, you're here and you hear some, uh, somebody else's voice speaking into your mind and your ear and whispering, no, no one could love you like that. I mean, obviously, if they knew this, they wouldn't. Or would you really think that you deserve to be loved after God loves you knowing all of that. And I want God's love for you to scream louder than the lies, to scream louder than those falsehoods, because God loves you and nothing will change that. There is nothing that we can do that will cause him to love us less, and there's nothing we can do to get him to love us more, because he already loves us perfectly. God loves you perfectly, completely, passionately. God checks yes to the question of, do you love me? God loves you regardless of anything about you. That goes into the second thing that Hosea tells us, is that God's love for us gives us a new and better story. God's love for us gives us a new and better story. It says in the second verse there, verses two and three of chapter three. So I, I bought her, Hosea speaking, I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I will behave the same way 
toward you. Now, there's a little bit of disagreement as far as, or unclarity as far as why Gomer, uh, what was going on with Gomer that Hosea would need to do this. At the very least, it might have been some type of extreme debt that she was in. More than likely, she was enslaved in some way. But regardless, her choices and her lifestyle, which were probably great in the moment, led her being trapped in some way. She didn't see the consequences maybe in the moment of whatever she was doing, but they were there waiting for her, and now she's in them. And Hosea came and paid whatever was needed to be paid to get her out of that. He set her free. He gave her a new chance. Now, to clarify again, the message here is not that the woman Gomer needed the man to come and rescue her. That's not what this is sending. But remember, this is a message, this is God sending a message to Israel and all of humanity through this family. And the message is good news. That God, we do, all of us, regardless of who we are, need to be removed, rescued from our, the consequences of our choices, the brokenness that comes from our sins. And God is the one who rescues us. Like Gomer, we are trapped in the consequences of our choices. It says in Romans, everyone has sinned. All have fallen short of God's glorious standard. It says in Romans 6, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. And the reality is, is that whether it's big or small, we all know the fact that we do things that we mess up. We do things that, as we shouldn't, we don't... Um, comparing ourselves to the reality of who God is, we don't measure up to that reality. And even though we might do good, even though we try our hardest, we will not equal the reality of the goodness of God. And when we make those mistakes, when we mess up, it causes brokenness in our lives. It can cause brokenness in others. We can see brokenness in our world because of the choices that people make, doing their own thing rather than trusting and following the goodness of God. Like Hosea, God did what was needed to set us free and restore us. It says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. I already read Romans 5, but reading it again. For God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And in John 3, 16, it says, for God, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. And that's the really important part of that. God wants to rescue us. Jesus wants us to know grace. Jesus wants us to know mercy. Jesus doesn't want us to be beat up by guilt or shame. He wants us to know healing. He wants us to know forgiveness. He wants us to have the, the, the fullness of our heart's desires met, but realizing that they can only be met in him. Nothing else in this world, nothing that we can come up with or anyone else can come up will satisfy our hearts. No one else will get us out of that brokenness. It's only God who redeems us. It's only God who saves us. It says in Hosea, later in the book, it says in chapter 14, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. And this is the life which God provides for us. This is the good news, to be healed, to be loved, to have new life, to have a new identity, to know no shame, no guilt, to have a blooming life in him. This is simply not a love to hear about, though. It leads to the last thing, is that if God's love for us gives us a new and better story, then the last thing is that God's love for us must be received. God's love for us must be received. It says in verse 4, 
For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. Israel's going to go on for a long way just getting what they wanted. You know, I don't want... I'm not, I don't want to be with the Lord. I don't want to follow his ways. I don't want to be in relationship with him. I'm just going to do my own thing. And they're going to get exactly what they want. And some of those things are good. Some of those things are enjoyable. But they don't do for our souls what our souls need. And they ultimately, we turn bad things into good things because we expect them to do things they can't do. They cannot heal and restore our souls. And so in that, God's going to give them exactly what they want, but it's eventually going to run out. It's eventually going to show itself to not give us what we want it to do. And just like the young man in the Gospels, when Jesus told this story about this guy who said, Dad, I want my inheritance now. I want everything now. I just want to go and live. And he got it all, and he squandered it, and he was bankrupt, and he was just in the gutter, no job, by himself, and wretched. And he comes to the point of realizing everything I wanted, everything I thought I needed, it's just led me here. Maybe my father will take me back. Maybe he'll give me a job. Maybe I can make ends meet that way. And he goes back to his father, and his father comes out and wraps his arms around him, gives him a new new clothing and a new robe, and says, let's party, because now my son who was lost is now found. And that's the picture that we have here is that Israel's going to realize that all of this that they wanted doesn't cut it. And afterward, they will return and seek the Lord. And the Lord is always there with outstretched arms. You know, there's, whether you've already had some Christmas moments, we had had family Christmas yesterday, we're doing more next weekend with the other parts of the family It's going to be a lot of gifts going on over the next week. And no one gets a gift and then just lets it sit there. No one, like, here's your gifts. Okay, well, are you going to open them? No, I'm good. There's craziness within that, right? We would think there's something wrong, like this is the worst joke you've done. You get a gift, you open it. Well, this is the reality of God's love for us, the gift of God's love. The gift of what God has given us in Jesus. It's not just a reality that's just there floating there. We have to receive that gift. You have to receive the love of God. It It says in Romans, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God has done everything that is necessary to bring us back into relationship with him. God has loved us and done everything possible so that our sins could be forgiven and we could know life as it was meant to be. That he is holding that gift out to you. But you have to receive it. You have to believe in him in faith. You have to say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. And I pray that you do that today. It doesn't mean you have to come up and fill out a form or ask me for my permission or talk to me about it or or get your parents' permission or, uh, well, my parents have always believed this. Aren't I grandfathered in? No, that's not how any of that works. You have to, on your own, make the decision I want to be a child of God. I want to receive what God has provided for me. And so I pray that today is the day that that happens for you. I pray that today, this Christmas, you receive the gift of God's love and find life in him. Because there is nothing that we can receive in the next week or ever that will give our hearts what it's longing for. And there is nothing that we can receive in this next week or ever that will compare to all that God is offering us. But you have to receive it. It says in Ephesians 3, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people 
to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know the love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And I pray that you know and experience his love in that way. For some of you, that's the thing you need to hear is you need to begin, you need to receive this gift of love. But for others of us, we need to be reminded of the love of God. You know, we talked about in Hosea that where I read in chapter 14, I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. And so this image of this flower growing and blooming. But just because God's love grants us that, God's love gives us that life. But it doesn't mean that the flower will not have to face the elements. It doesn't mean that there won't be any more storms. It doesn't mean life won't be difficult. But what it means is that we have somebody who loves us beyond what we can comprehend with us through the storms. We are not alone in the difficulties. We're not alone in the confusion. We might not understand, but we have a God who loves us, who does. And so I don't need to understand to trust him. And I don't need to understand to know that he's good. And so I can trust the love that God has for me. And so, child of God, who are you trusting right now? Make sure to keep your eyes on him in the midst of your circumstances. May you know and experience the immeasurable love of God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for how you have loved us, how you continue to love us. Jesus, we are grateful for your sacrifice in our place. God, we are thankful for your work on the cross, your conquering sin and conquering death in the resurrection. God, I pray for those who don't know you that today would be the day of finding new life, of receiving the good news, of having a new story begin. God, for those of us who have a relationship with you, I pray that you would fill us, fill our tanks with encouragement and joy because of the love which you have for us. God, help us to know and to never doubt that you check yes for loving us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us? So we're going to do this last song. And, and as you do, as we do this song, if it can be an encouragement to you, if you, if you know that today is the day that you need to trust in Jesus, I'm going to ask you to make a bold step, and that's to come up here and, uh, and pray about that. You can just come and sit in the front pew and just pray then, or you can want to come and pray with me. And not that that does anything special, but there is something about taking that step of faith and praying uh, with somebody just to show that this is I'm I this is serious. I'm doing this. And so if that's what you need to do today, then please while the while the song don't wait for it to be over. While the song's going on, come up and pray. Let me pray with you. Uh, but wherever you're at, let this be an encouragement. Uh, just to, to know and experience the love of God. Let's worship together.